Brady looking that way and fires that way, and it's going to be caught in this Godwin making the catch. Simply unbelievable. Was there a push or not? Certainly got knocked Ooh, to baby. the ground. And there it is. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers best the Dallas Cowboys. The story with Tom Brady, as it always is, is is he paying the refs? Is he using steroids? We don't know. Huge game last night. Man, usually these games are just a butt whipping by the Super Bowl champ, but it's always nice to, ha- nice to have a great game. We're going to get into some of my takeaways. Was that a push? Why wasn't Brady called for intentional grounding? Because he's Tampa Bay Brady. Of course. Huge show today. It's Football Friday. I'm going to try to get to all of it. Nick, why is the show coming out so late? Because I had to watch highlights for the first time all season. I'm so excited. We're going to get into some wide receiver stuff, some quarterback stuff, some college football stuff. But we begin today with either a murder in the NFL or a massive lawsuit for a fantasy football journalist who is attempting to do actual Big J journalism. I cannot discourage football journalists enough from trying to do this kind of thing. I would just do what the police department says word for word. DeAndre Swift. I'm a Detroit Lions fan. Let me disclose that first. That being said, none of the Lions are good enough right now for me to really stand for them, especially if I don't know they're implicated in a murder. This is what's happening right now. I will give you the information. I'll pull up the tweet. This is how it started. So allegedly there's a picture somewhere on the internet of DeAndre Swift being present at a crime scene. It is not clear whether or not that's a hoax. So let's find out. This is Dave Klug or Klug. No idea. He's a fantasy football writer from Denver. Quote, I just called the Philly PD and spoke with an officer in the commissioner's office. There was an anonymous tip that came in via tip line over two months ago that implicated DeAndre Swift in a murder. The officer said that Swift is not being investigated at this time. Now ask yourself, who benefits from that tweet? The writer, of course, obviously. Is he a big deal? No, he is not a big deal. Should he be verified? No, he should not be verified. To me, right now, he seems like the problem. Secondly, the fact that Philly PD, and I lived in Philly, the fact that they released this information means that not only is he not a suspect, that either A, they're playing the media to try to get as much information as possible, and he secretly is a suspect, or B, someone, they, they cleared him, and they're just saying this, like, dude, go away. He then followed up this tweet by saying, there was a Reddit post two days ago, and this is where this all started. There was a Reddit post two days ago that started the rumors. The accusations found their way to Twitter in the morning. It was picked up steam. The intention was not to draw attention to the situation or defame Swift's character, but to clear his name. Bullshit. Bullshit. Your intention was to get famous. Your intention was to get clout. You're clout chasing. You're trying to be a real journalist. Anytime, sports journalism is not journalism. That's my hot take. Anytime there's a real story, the big J journals come in. And if you think that the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Detroit Free Press are not all over over this, those newspapers are older than some states in this country. They're going to figure this out. But this guy's going to be in hot water if DeAndre's got good lawyers because he didn't word it correctly. We'll get into that in a minute. But let's try to figure out what's actually going on. The Philadelphia Police Department did the following. This is great. PPD, which has an official Twitter account, cannot am- imagine how crappy those mentions are. They released a statement. Here's a statement. I'll read it in full. It's on your screen if you're on YouTube. The Philadelphia Police Department is aware that an image showing law enforcement sensitive information has been posted on multiple social media networks. We cannot comment on the contents as they pertain to ongoing criminal investigations. However, the PPD has opened an internal investigation into the validity of the image. If the image is found to be authentic, the department will work to identify the person or persons responsible for its release and will seek appropriate action. So what they're saying is they're not even worried about Swift. They haven't named him a suspect. He's not being investigated at all. Multiple big J's, including someone we'll get to in a second, said he's not a suspect at all. And what PPD is saying is this better be a hoax or someone's getting fired. This better be a hoax or someone's getting fired. To me, this seems like one of two things. Either A, DeAndre Swift is in, is going to be in some hot water and where there's smoke, there's fire, or B, someone hates him on the streets of Philly and they're doing this to ruin his name. I think that it is literally one of those two things. So uh, let's get into Benjamin Albright's tweet. I'm not going to pull him up right there. Benjamin Albright's uh, an NFL writer. Most people hate him. Some people like him. He does sort of good work. Uh, he says there's a lot of stuff going around. He's not a suspect, but so far P- Philly PD says he's not a suspect. He is, of course, someone who uh, would have followed up on this. That's what's going on with DeAndre Swift. This is something we're going to pay attention to, obviously, for fantasy stuff, but also because it's news. This is crazy. 
I thought about calling PPD and asking, hey, why would you ever comment to a fantasy football writer? Uh, Because I thought about doing real journalism stuff, but then I decided to work out and listen to podcasts instead because, you know, um, (laughs) this is silliness. Either he's a suspect and they're going to name him and either try to prove murder against him or whatever, accessory to murder, or he's not and someone hates him, in which case, like, I don't care about it. It is what it is. Okay. Other stuff we're going to get to today. Jamar Chase is going to have a tough time in the NFL. Uh Uh-oh. But let's start with the um, NFL kickoff game. What a game. I have a couple quick takeaways. Takeaway number one is that, man, if Dallas could just find themselves like a Grady Jarrett or a Fletcher Cox, they'd be good. They they looked way better than I thought they looked. They looked better coached than the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, for sure. Secondly, and I'm going to say this as emphatically as I possibly can, Dak Prescott was the better quarterback on the field. And it was not close, which is fine. Tom Brady is good because he's a champion, not because he's an elite quarterback talent anymore. He hasn't been elite for five years. He's a champion. It's the little things. That's why he's so good. And in the playoffs, I'd probably rather have Tom because, you know, you have all the evidence. But over a season, I'd rather have Dak. Dak was outstanding. 58 attempts, 403 passing yards against the defense that shut Mahomes down. Now, obviously, the pass rush, blah, 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 blah. The Cowboys look good. That Connor McGovern kid is not a great offensive lineman, but he's a damn good offensive lineman. He should probably be starting somewhere. They could probably trade him. I don't know what they're going to do, but he's really good. Penn State kid, Notre Dame kid. Zeke Elliott pissed off a lot of fantasy owners last night. 11 carries for 33 yards, but the Bucks have great defensive linemen. Uh, Tom Brady, uh, four touchdowns, two interceptions, one of which I don't think should count. Those end-of-half interceptions are BS to me. Nobody could run the ball. That's the crazy thing about this. Everyone's like, how's Dallas going to run the ball? So let's just go through it. Leonard Fournette, Nine carries, 32 yards. Trash. Ronald Jones, four carries, 14 yards. Trash. Antonio Brown had a sweep for six yards. Trash. Antonio Brown is back. We knew that would work. Who drafted in fantasy? This guy did. Who drafted him in daily fantasy? This guy did. Five catches, 121, and a touchdown. Man, he looked good. Chris Godwin, nine catches, 105, and a touchdown. The big story from this game, if you want to talk about it at the water cooler, is did Chris Godwin push off? Yes, he did. Do they call that? Not always. The bigger story to me from a refing standpoint was the play before. It looked like Tom committed... Intentional grounding. He threw it away in bounds. No pressure. He just threw it away. Dak Prescott spoke with reporters after the game, of course, and he said he thought he feels better than he did before. The direct quote from Dak is, I don't feel like I say these things just to say them, so it's a credit to the work that I put in. Quote, he enjoyed every moment of it. No, I feel like I'm a better player than I was when I left the field last year, and I told y'all that was the expectations I had for myself. Well, he looked like one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL last night. Headed for some hardware for sure, I think. All right, let's move into some other football news. Yesterday, two big things happened at Ravens practice, uh, and they're both the same thing. ACL tears for uh, Peters, the cornerback, and Edwards, the running back. They're now down to like the third string running back. They're going to have to sign one of these guys that's cut or still available. Todd Gurley is 27 years old, and he's out of football right now. That's how bad his knee situation is. There was a, there was a day in college where we're like, wow, that guy is Herschel Walker. And then in the pros, like, that guy is kind of maybe the MVP. What a player Todd Gurley was. And he has that arthritic situation in his knee, which is a bummer, but maybe the Ravens will call him. Gus Edwards and I think Marcus Peters are out with ACL tears. They have a bunch of other people. Their quarterback doesn't get vaccinated, so he's going to miss, miss a game from that at some point, I would imagine. I think he did last year, for sure. Uh, let's get to Jamar Chase. Oh, man, Jamar Chase. So, like, listen, I have a firm belief, and I was educated in football by a guy named Pino from South Philly, at NFL films. And he and and I would debate a lot of things, but one thing that we agreed on is in the first round, a a first round draft pick is never wasted on an offensive lineman or a defensive back. Well, the Cincinnati Bengals and the Miami Dolphins for what it's worth chose to take wide receivers over the best offensive lineman, according to most people or another offensive lineman, if they hadn't wanted someone. So the Bengals drafted Jamar chase, who was widely considered the best wide receiver available. He was on the LSU national championship team. He then held out, or he didn't hold out. He opted out from COVID, which is smart. LSU was trash, and like, hey, why why risk it? Uh, And then Jalen Waddell was the speed guy for Alabama. After them, the Detroit Lions took Panay Sewell. So those three guys are going to be linked forever. The Bengals need everything. So should they have taken a lineman? Should they have taken a receiver? To me, you take take the lineman. Finding elite linemen is hard. Finding a good wide receiver is easy. Chris Godwin last night was the best player on the field. He's a third rounder. Antonio Brown was the second best wide receiver on the field. He was a sixth rounder. You got CeeDee Lamb and Amari Cooper. Those were first rounders. But like all things considered, Stefan Diggs is not a first rounder. Adam Thielen is not a first rounder. Kenny Galladay is not a first rounder. Michael Gallup is not a first rounder. 
So you can find receivers. You can't find linemen. So they're linked together. Now Jamar Chase has had the drop seas to the point where they're putting him in positions he's not been in just so that he can get an easy catch on like a swing pass. And he drops those. So, oh, excuse me, got a cough. High-level production here. This is what he said yesterday. This is amazing. Per pro football talk, Jamar Chase says that the NFL ball is harder to catch than the NCAA ball because it's harder to see without white stripes. Ut oh. What? Um, it is different. Let's read the whole thing. This is via Bengals. They published this. This is from Bengals.com. The Bengals published this. Quote, the ball is different because it's bigger. It doesn't have the white stripes on the side, so you can't see the ball coming from the tip point. So you actually have to look for the strings on the ball at the top, which is hard to see because the whole ball is brown and you have six strings that are white. But for the most part, just have to get used to it and find out what I am comfortable with catching. Well, at least you... You know, he didn't opt out and have all year to work on this. An entire year of not playing football to catch an NFL ball. At least you didn't have to do that. Bro, that is... This guy is a bust. Yeah, this guy sucks. He's a bust. All right, college football coming up this weekend. We're going to do a college football preview. I'm going to try to keep this show to 15 minutes. I'm going to do my... Do my very best. There are some good uh, games on this weekend. They kick at noon, which is awesome. I hate when they kick in at night because I'm so annoyed. Last night, I had to watch the last fourth quarter in bed, and I missed some plays because I dozed off with my phone on my face. I'm getting old. Living in the East Coast is trash for sports. The big game that everyone's going to be talking about is number 12, Oregon, at number 3, Ohio State. I love Oregon in the bet. Ohio State is a 15-point favorite against Oregon. Uh, Oregon has some of the best trench players and defensive players in the country, period. Like They are... From a draft standpoint and from an actual college football standpoint, Oregon's defensive talent is better than Ohio State's offensive talent, period. Kayvon Thibodeau is incredible. If you're a football god, he is is erotic to watch on the defensive end. He is incredible. I love the way he plays football. Uh, Of course, they have a couple linebackers and defensive backs that are good. I love that game. That's a big game that people are going to be talking about that kicks at noon. Uh, other games that kick early in the day, uh, 3.30 Texas A&M at Colorado. Colorado is technically a non-conference Power 5 opponent. Whatever. You know, it is what it is. Um, the Cyhawk Trophy is up for grabs for the first time. Both teams ranked in the top 10. Number 10, Iowa visits. Number 9, Iowa State. Iowa owns, and I mean owns, the Cyclones in this game recently. Um Cyclones, four and a half point favorite. They went down in the rankings despite winning because I don't forget who they played, but they, they had a pretty tough time with them. NC State and Mississippi State, that'll be a pretty fun one. That's a, that's a non-conference game between opponents. It's like a reasonably scheduled thing. The SEC gets a lot of crap for not playing hard schedules. No, that's just, it's just Alabama. They don't play on the road. Non-conference teams on the road, they just don't do it. The last time they did it was like Penn State in 2010 or something. But Mississippi State has a home and home with NC State. This one is in Starkville. Uh, Mississippi State has a cool story for 9-11. The White House asked Mississippi State to be the first sporting event in, in football, first football game, pro or college, after the 9-11 attacks. They, they called the SEC commissioner. They called the athletic directors of South Carolina and Mississippi State and said, you know, we'd really like to see some football. How about playing on Thursday? And they did. Uh, so pretty cool, pretty cool moment. You might want to tune into that to see what I would imagine would be some pretty cool memorial stuff from uh, the 9-11. Uh, other in-state rival, New Mexico State and New Mexico. A lot of... Uh, Local recruits probably up for grabs there. If you're tooling around at 7 p.m. and just want to check in on some stuff, I imagine that one will be fun. But the big rivalry game this weekend, which is funny because this game used to be at the last game of the year before Utah became relevant. Utah makes the 45-minute drive to BYU. They are a seven-point favorite at the Cougars. I think that's low. BYU cannot hang with Utah recently. They're just, they're just not in the same stratosphere. They just aren't even with Zach Wilson. But it's one of those things where Mississippi and Mississippi State are like this too, where if the other one didn't exist or was worse, then the good one would win a lot more. Like if Utes, when they were like a borderline playoff team, if they had Zach Wilson, they'd probably go to the playoff. And I like their chances against LSU. It's just unfortunate. But you want to see a really pretty game? That's a pretty game. That's red jerseys versus blue jerseys. It's classic. It's going to pop. They hate each other. Uh, the crowd at Lavelle Edwards Stadium is, is awesome. They really, I cannot describe to you how much they hate each other. Um, it's, a, it's a really fun game. Okay, games that kick today, Kansas Coast Carolina, UTEP and Boise State. Ole Miss, I believe, plays today as well against some team that they're going to annihilate. For all of you football NFL football fans that are looking for a quarterback, Ole Miss will be the quarterback that you start opining for. Over? For? I don't know. Or care. Uh, Matt Corral is the guy that you want. All right. 
Let's run down some NFL stuff. I remember I'm going to do an NFL preview show and a deep dive on Sunday morning. It'll be available. Uh, let's do some best bets. I have a couple best bets for you. I just want to check one thing at the line move. The Lions and the Niners line moved. It appears that left tackle Taylor Decker, one of Detroit's only really good shining bright spots, is not going to play because of a finger. That makes the Niners go from a 7.5 point favorite to a 9 point favorite. I think that's a little low. I think without Taylor Decker, that's going to be the difference between drives. Taylor Decker versus Nick Bosa is a relevant matchup that Taylor Decker is going to win occasionally. Whoever they're going to replace him with, I don't know. It's not going to be good. So I think nine might be low. That's the best bet for sure. Uh, The Eagles are three-point dogs on the roads against the Falcons. Oh, my God, I love this. I love the Eagles outright in my best bets. And then, of course, for Sunday night football, the Los Angeles Rams are favored by seven and a half against the Chicago Bears. That's low. Matthew Stafford's revenge with a relevant coaching staff and a good defense. They're going to beat the they're going to beat the Bears by double digits. If you could lightning bet this, I would lightning bet this. Yeah, the Rams are going to win. I would say by somewhere between 10 to 15. They will win by multiple touchdowns. It's going to be a Matthew Stafford coming out party and a fire Matt Nagy party, and he's going to extract revenge on the Chicago franchise. It's going to be a great week of football. Remember, Tune in for the Sunday morning deep dive. Might as well give it a shot. I'm always so mad on Sunday mornings. You know what I could use? I could use a good NFL preview podcast. And I don't want to sit around and watch seven men in suits take turns yelling at each other. I would like to listen to three guys sitting around a coffee table talking to each other. So I'll try to provide you with a bit of a deep dive. And maybe there will be some relevant college football to talk about. Like, rate, review, subscribe. Give me some feedback. Give me some advice. You know, basically just trying to help you guys start your day off with a little bit of sports. It's available on YouTube and wherever podcasts are found. I'll be back better than ever Sunday morning for NFL Sunday football. That's going to be my birthday. Say happy birthday, Nick. September 12th.